Our scripture reading on this Lord's Day comes to us from Samuel, 1 Samuel, in chapter 11, 1 Samuel 11. Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a treaty with us. And we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, On this condition will I make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all your right eyes, and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers throughout all the territory of Israel. Then, if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. When the messengers came to Gabeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. Now, behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, What is wrong with the people that they are weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh, and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul. And when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled, He took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. And then in verses 8 through, um, I guess 8 through 10, it's just about them gathering 330,000 people etc., etc. Then we pick up on verse 11. And the next day, Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch. That's like between 2 and 6 a.m. in the morning watch. And struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered, so that no two of them were left together. Then the people said to Samuel, Who is it that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring them in, that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingdom. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul And all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given it to us. We have read it now, Father. And we ask that you implant it in our hearts and in our lives. Teach us. Move us through the power of your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Everybody likes a new beginning, don't they? A fresh start. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons we like wedding days. It's a new beginning for people. Uh, The birth of a child. Um, I remember my principal when I taught in high school years ago, he said that one of the reasons he loved education is because every school year is a new beginning. Everybody gets a clean slate. And if that's true in, uh, in an educational setting, I believe it's infinitely true in the kingdom of God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The, the, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's a new beginning, isn't it? That's a fresh start. In other words, when somebody becomes a Christian, the transformation that occurs is not a superficial transformation. It is a radical transformation. When a person professes faith in Christ, they don't receive just a new coat of paint. You know, it's just not slapped on them and it's some sort of a minor remodeling. Instead, it's like what happens so often these days. You know, uh, you see it with convenience stores and companies. They don't just remodel the store. What do they do? They go in and they flatten it. They tear it completely down and they build a new structure from scratch. In a very literal sense, the old building has what? It's passed away, and behold, the new building has come. 
yet the transformation that's, bring, that's brought about when somebody through grace, by faith in Jesus Christ uh, is transformed, it's more than just that instantaneous miracle. It's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong process that theologians call sanctification. In other words, Christ comes in when somebody receives that, old values, old ideas, old plans, old loves, old desires, they vanish. They begin to pass away and they're replaced by new loves, new desires, new plans, new ideas, all these things that accompany salvation. But these new things, you know, they don't happen all at once. They must be worked out. What is worked What is placed within us must be worked out. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 verses 13 and 14. He he writes there that we must work out. You must work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now why must you work out your salvation in fear and trembling? Because it is God who works in you. It is God who works in you to do his will and his good pleasure. Now in the commentaries... They tell us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that it's written in such a way, the commentators tell us it's written in such a way in the Greek that it refers to a past action that has continuing results in the here and now. A past action that has continuing results in the present. In other words, being a Christian isn't a one-time experience. Oh, I slipped my hand up revival, and that's when I become a Christian, but I've never lived for Christ since then. Oh, I was saved during Bible school, but I've never lived for Christ since I was saved in Bible school. I, I was prayed the prayer, and I joined the church, but I haven't ever lived for Christ since then. If that's all there was to your conversion, and there never was any change, you better check your conversion. You better check and see if you've really been saved, if you've really experienced the work of God. Why? Because that's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 is teaching us. It tells us that the past action, that prayer that you prayed, that conversion experience that happened, it results in a continuing thing in your life, a continuous result. In other words, what happened to you that day or that night or whenever it was with Christ has an impact on you today, in this moment, in this right now. You're not yet who, who you, you're not who you once were, but, you know, but you're not who you're going to be. Does that make sense? You're not yet who you're going to be, but you're no longer who you once were. There is this transformation, there is this process that's going on. Being a Christian, being a new creation in Christ is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing process. Our old nature, our old values are being torn down and replaced with that new nature that has been implanted within us by the power of the Holy Spirit through God. And this new beginning, this new nature, it comes to us only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And I do all that, and you say, well, I thought we were in 1 Samuel chapter 11, not 2 Corinthians 5. Well, 1 chapter Sam, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11 talks about new birth. It's a new birth of its own. Israel has a new king, Saul. The Lord promised through this new king, what would he do? He would bring salvation. He would bring deliverance through the king uh, from a, a king of Israel would deliver Israel from its enemies in battle. The commentaries, in fact, tell us that the Hebrew root word, meaning to save and to deliver, it happens three times in this 11th chapter, in verses 3, 9, and 13. So this 11th chapter is about how the newly appointed king will bring deliverance to God's people. It's a, it's a comeback, if you will. It's a comeback to the taunting question from chapter 10, verse 27, which says, how will this fellow save us? And the answer we find in chapter 11 is, by the Spirit of the living God. That's how he will save us. And the story begins with trouble brewing in the east, uh, to the, or to the east of the Jordan River, from a guy named Nahash the Ammonite. Nahash literally means snake, the snake. So it's Nahash the snake. And it seems that he was threatening to attack the city of Jabesh Gilead. Apparently, Nahash and his army were well-known. They were powerful. 
because when they show up, the men there of Jabesh, they don't even offer to fight. They just said, uh, make a treaty with us and we'll serve you. Loosely translated, Nahash's response to, the, to, the, to this is, uh, okay, no problem. Here's what you got to do. Let me gouge out the right eye of everybody in town and then that will bring disgrace on all of Israel. Now, to gouge out the right eye meant that the men and the families of Jabesh would be subservient to Nahash for the rest of their lives because it made, it made them unfit for military service. The left eye was usually, you know, you hold up a shield, it was usually covered by the shield, and if you don't have a right eye, you can't fight because you can't fight what you can't sight, right? So that's what's happening here. But Nahash's primary goal wasn't to produce a group of disabled veterans. His greatest delight, apparently, was uh, to disgrace all of Israel. That's what he wanted to do. So the men of Jabesh Gilead, they, they ponder all of this, and they say, could we get back to you on all that? You know, that's a tempting offer, you know, the gouging out of the right eye thing. But can we do a little social media? Can we contact the folks around us just, to, just for the next week and see if anybody will help us? I mean, you know, the gouging of the eye out, you know, we, we want to think about that. Uh, is that Okay. Nahash, who is apparently supremely confident and obviously cruel, agrees to their request. I say that Nahash is cruel for a couple of reasons. First, I've already mentioned it. He wants to bring disgrace on all of Israel. Second reason is because he gives these people a week to think about having their right eye gouged out. I mean, could you think about that, worrying about that for a week? Worrying about having that happen to you and then you're going to be a slave for the rest of your life. It's as if Nahash is taking delight and slowly but surely turning the screws of humiliation and fear upon the people of Jabesh. He will enjoy watching them sweat as they look for help that he believes will never ever come. After all, they, when they asked for help from their neighbors the last time the Ammonites attacked, nobody would come. Why should they come now? Now, if you want to read about that, that's in Judges chapter 11. That's when that happened. They asked for help and nobody came. So that Jahash should, or excuse me, that Nahash should enjoy such cruelty shouldn't be surprising to us. And before we say to ourselves, yeah, those guys from ancient history, they were ruthless, they were heartless, they were cruel. I'm glad I live in a civilized society. I'm glad humanity has evolved beyond all that kind of behavior here in the 21st century. Have we really? Have we really evolved beyond all that? Terrorists strap bombs to themselves, run into stores, blow up, kill innocent people, or they get behind the wheel of a vehicle and plow through a crowd, killing random people. Kids going to school, shooting their classmates and their teachers. Then I read about the man in Westmoreland, Tennessee, uh, who this past week is accused of beating seven people to death, including his parents and a 12-year-old girl. We look for psychological reasons, always something in his past, sociological reasons, something in the culture, educational, you know, we can cure it psychologically, uh, physio uh, physiologically, something wrong, chemically, and all those things, but we fail to look at the heart of the matter, which is, as we say, a matter of the heart, in other words, a theological reason. Jeremiah 17, 9 gives us the answer as to where these sorts of evils come from. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? People say, they ask you, well, how do I know what to do? And somebody rep responds, well, it's just follow your heart. Nuh-uh. <laughs> follow the scripture. Follow the scripture. Because what does the Bible say about the heart? It is deceitful. It is wicked. What did Jesus say about the heart? What comes out of a man? What comes out of a woman? That's what makes them unclean. For within, out of the hearts of men and women, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, 
envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. That's what Jesus said in Mark 7. The scriptures are clear. Evil flows from the hearts of depraved sinners such as you and such as I. But we're far more refined. We're far more refined here in the kind of cruelty we inflict. Just a word or two behind somebody's back. Raised eyebrow at the right point in a conversation. I'm not going to this gathering because so-and-so is going to be there. We, aren't hold, we withhold forgiveness. We exact our own personal judgment on somebody. Is it more civilized? Is it more refined? Perhaps. Is it more Christian? Is it more Christ-like? Simply because we don't hurt them physically? Is it more loving? Is it more forgiving? Is it more compassionate? Is it more of what Christ has called us to? No. Another truth from this passage is the hatred and arrogance that the world has for God's people. Nahash attacks Israel because he sees an opportunity to maim and destroy and humiliate the people of God. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bring, bring disgrace upon the people of God. And the same thing happens in our day and our age. The arrogance and, hate, uh, and hatred for the people of God never ceases. The Ammonite mindset, if you will, the Ammonite mindset of maiming and hurting and destroying God's people, it's always here. It's always here. Secular worldview, secular liberal theology, they constantly bully evangelical Christians. And I say it's bullying because of this. It's either believe what we believe or we'll shut your business down. Come around to our, our way of thinking or we'll remove you from your place of employment. Say what we want you to say and if you don't say what, you, what we want you to say, we're going to shout you down and call you every name in the book. Come around to our way of thinking or else. In other words, gouge out the right eye of the Word of God. Gouge out your right eye of 2,000 years of biblical teaching, of biblical truth, and bow down to us. Serve us. Our agenda. We shouldn't be surprised by such hatred and arrogance and prejudice toward Christianity. 1 John 3.13 Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. So what do we do? How do we face such hatred, such arrogance? Only one way, by the power and the spirit of the living God. The spirit that rushed upon Saul when the messengers of Jabesh Gilead came to him in verse 6. And when the spirit rushed upon Saul, it made all the difference. All the difference. Saul summoned Israel's army by way of a threat. He divided his troops. He attacked the Ammonites in the early morning hours. He took them completely by surprise and he routed them. Verse, that's verse 11. In other words, the Spirit came upon Saul, equipped him to do the task that the Lord had set before him. It's as, in fact, Saul is described here, if you will, as a super judge. If you've ever read the book of Judges, you know, the judges, there wasn't a king, and there, God would appoint a judge to deliver the people of Israel, people like, uh, like, like Samson, who I'm going to talk about, like Gilead, uh, I want to say Gilead, but it's... Ah, I lost the name. But anyway, Othanol, Ahud, these judges that would deliver God's people. Okay? We know this because the Hebrew word to tell us that the spirit, spirit rushed upon Saul is the same Hebrew word that's used with Samson. And that's the only time it's used in the Bible is with Samuel and, or excuse me, with Saul and with Samson. It's used in connection with the Spirit of God rushing upon them. Another sign that Saul is a super judge is that he divides his troops. And like, like Gideon, that's the G one, like Gideon uh, and did in Judges 7. What did Gideon do there? Uh, and then Saul, Saul hacks up and FedExes his, his oxen around, uh, around the, uh, don't worry about that, 
around the uh, country of Israel, around the nation of Israel, and it's a reminder of the terrible incidents that happened in Judges 19 in which a man took his concubine, hacked her into 12 pieces, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. That's a terrible incident. Saul is also described as a savior here, a term that's used for other judges like Ahud and Othniel. The point here is that the writer of Samuel is telling us this. This is what God's spirit does. It takes this shy farmer that was hiding among the luggage. Remember, he's hiding among the Samsonite, and he makes him function like a super judge. He equips him to do more than anyone, even Saul himself, thinks he could ever do. What's God called you to do that you think, I could never, ever do that? What's he calling you to do? I can't teach that Sunday school class. I can't be an elder. I can't do this. I can't help with the children. I can't help with the youth. Well, you know, the same Saul or the same spirit that equipped Saul will equip you. If you're hiding in the baggage, God will find you. God will find you. He'll equip you to be an elder. He'll equip you to teach Sunday school. He'll equip you to work with children or with youth. He'll equip you if God's calling you to preach or to teach or whatever. The Lord will give you what you need for the task. Something else we learn here is that the Spirit of God not only calls and equips, He takes what you, th you and I think is worthless and transforms it. God takes what we believe to be an ending and he changes it into a beginning. Remember the story that I mentioned a while ago about the concubine that was hacked into pieces and mailed throughout all the nation of Israel. That terrible incident happened in Gibeah. Gibeah is Saul's hometown. And you can read about that terrible incident in Judges, I think it's chapters 19 through 21. Brief synopsis. But Gibeah becomes Sodom and Gomorrah for an evening. Sexual perverts abuse a woman through one long night of terror until the, uh, the breaking of dawn brings her the relief, sadly, of death. Her master mails out the pieces of her body to call the people of Israel to battle against the tribe of Benjamin where Gabeah is located. Now why fight them? Why fight Benjamin or Gabeah of Benjamin? Because the people of Gabeah have no sorrow. They have no repentance for what they've done. They are so rebellious and insistent that they are not perverts, that they should not receive justice for their actions. What happens? A horrible war ensues. And they do indeed receive wrath. But now, what happens to Gabeah, this place of darkness and this place of perversion? It's a source of salvation and deliverance. Who would have ever thought that anything or anyone good could have ever come out of Gabeah? But that's where Saul the Deliverer is from. It's amazing how God brings light out of darkness. How he takes what we believe to be useless and he uses it for his glory. What a difference the Spirit of God makes. What about you? You ever thought of yourself as useless and worthless because of the sins of your past? You ever thought that you've done too much, said too much, rebelled too much? Nothing good could ever come out of me. The Lord would never use the likes of me. Never forget what the difference, what a huge difference the Spirit of God makes. Remember that the Lord takes what once was considered darkness and transforms it into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.9 And that God, by his spirit, you know what he does? He takes the old building of your life, he demolishes it, he flattens it out, and then he bakes a new one. He takes the old and makes it pass away and he gives birth to the new, the God of a new beginning. The God of a fresh start, if you will. And this truth is emphasized beginning in verse 14 of, our, of, of 1 Samuel 11. Come, let us go to Gilgal and there renew the kingdom. 
Now this reminds us, if we know our Bibles, it reminds us that Gilgal is an important place because that's where God's power has worked before. It was at Gilgal that the Lord worked for his people against hopeless odds when they crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. It was at Gilgal that a new people of God started as they crossed that Jordan River after the rebellion and wandering in the wilderness. In other words, it was at Gilgal that the Lord God time and again called people to that fresh start. It was at Gilgal that he called them to repentance and renewal, to renew their allegiance to the kingdom of God. As believers in Jesus Christ, we're called to the same thing. We're called to a new beginning. We're called to renew our allegiance to Christ every day. Isn't Samuel's command to renew the kingdom of Gilgal the same command that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And if you ask what it means to seek his righteousness, he answered the question in the entire sermon in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It's here in that Sermon on the Mount that we hear the royal commands of Christ our King to be salt and light. To, to not be angry with our brother, to, to forgive as we have been forgiven, to put away our lust, to always tell the truth, to love our enemies, to pray for those who use us, and to, to not worry but to give our lives into the kingdom, into his hands, into our king's hands. And as we consider all these things, I don't know about you, but it brings me to my knees. We realize, and I realize, I'm no better than the children of Israel who rebelled and had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they rejected God as their king. No wonder it's been said that the Christian life is a life of constant repentance, a life of ever needing to renew our faith and renew our allegiance to Christ our King, to the rule of God. And I love Lamentations. I love Lamentations 3, 22, verses 22 and 23. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. Never. They never cease. His compassions, they never fail. They never fail. They are new every morning. Why do you have those devotionals in the morning? Because, man, when my feet hit the floor, I need it. His compassions, his love, his grace never fails. And it says there, great is thy faithfulness. His faithfulness is great. God offers a new beginning every day. He offers to pour out his love and his grace and his mercy and his compassion every day. Isn't it time that you went to Gilgal? Isn't it time that you come to that place of renewal and repentance? Isn't it time to answer the Lord's call that he's put upon your life? The Lord's call to set things right, to renew your relationship with him to bring that forgiveness that needs to be restored in a family relationship, in a work relationship, or, or, or a friend relationship. Isn't it time for that new beginning? Isn't it time to go to God in faith and in trust and in repentance because his grace and his faithfulness is new every morning? Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Most merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace to us. We thank you that you are a God of love and mercy, that your loving kindnesses indeed never cease, that your compassions never fail. So, Father, help us now to repent and renew our allegiance to your rule in our lives. May we ever, ever seek you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.